Empire. Hello and welcome to my podcast. Today, we're taking another look at the NFL Draft. It's only two months away. I'm joined by the Draft Network's Jordan Reed, a former college quarterback turned NFL Draft analyst. He's very good and informative. We discuss quarterbacks, of course, why the knocks on Justin Fields, some insight on Trey Lance, and maybe a mid-round quarterback to keep in mind, perhaps for Washington. Plus, a lot of talk about positions I think are more likely in the first round for Washington, offensive tackle and receiver. Plus, one linebacker that Reed pegged to Washington, that would be a big help. You can follow Jordan on Twitter at Jordan underscore Reed, R-E-I-D. And yes, he kind of addresses the namesake very late in the podcast. And you can listen to him on the Reed Option Podcast. That's R-E-I-D Option Podcast. You can read my work on ESPN.com. In addition to Twitter, I'm now on Instagram at John Kime ESPN. Also, do me a favor. If you, if you like the show, go provide us a rating, whether it's on Apple Podcasts, whatever. It all helps. If there's more you want to say, you want to say to me, you can always find me on Facebook, Twitter, and of course, now Instagram. Before I share my conversation with Jordan, a couple things. This will be an interesting week for Washington as Ron Rivera returns from vacation on Monday. He really didn't get any time off before last season, given all that they went through during the summer. Um, it was quite amazing. I mean, trust me, I was trying to interview him a couple of times while he was out on the golf course because there was never a break. And these guys need, we all need breaks. These guys really need a break. And given what he went through during the season, definitely needed a break. So he's had a few weeks off, but this is where it helps having guys like Mark Mayhew and Marty Herney in the building, guy, experienced guys that he absolutely trusts. It allowed Rivera to get away and to refresh. Anyway, Hernia and Mayhew have been playing catch up in a lot of ways the last couple of weeks, but with Rivera back, we could start to see some moves soon. And what those moves are, I don't know. Um, but they clearly, clearly the one to watch will be Alex Smith. Even without his comments last week to GQ, I think he would be on notice here. Nothing's a guarantee, but I don't believe those comments endeared him to anyone in the organization. And if he really wanted to take any, walk anything back, he would have done so by now. And you haven't seen any of the national types tweeting about how sources close to Smith say he regrets his choice of words, that he's reached out to Rivera, et cetera. I don't know if he's talked to Rivera or not. Alex Smith is typically not that open with things. So who knows? Um, but that's, but if that, when you start to see that, that's when you know there's a campaign to kind of try and change the narrative. The frustration he felt was real. So what he said wasn't a surprise, to be honest. The fact that he said him was. Whether that meant he wanted to leave the organization or not, I don't know that. I haven't heard that. Regardless, with Rivera off vacation, this will be an interesting week. Free agency starts March 17th. They don't have to cut Smith if they feel there's a chance they won't get someone else this offseason, but it has felt for a few weeks that the end is near. So we'll see. The other thing is I get asked a lot about cap casualties. Washington doesn't have a lot of guys outside of Smith who are going to save a lot of money against the cap um, and, and who are veterans. Those are the guys you usually cut. A lot of their veterans had small one or two year deals and the other, their other top players are all rookies making, you know, less money. So there aren't going to be a lot of those kind of moves this off season. Anyway, I've also been asked a few times as usual about Ruben linebacker, Ruben Foster. He's an unrestricted free agent. They kept him around last fall in IR in part because they knew it was a good place for him with a lot of his friends around, notably Ryan Anderson. I don't think it was as much because they felt like there was a, that maybe they could get a lot out of him in the future. I'd be shocked if Foster factors into their future. This group didn't bring him on board. They didn't draft him. They didn't sign him. Or they didn't claim him. He hasn't played since early 2018. Didn't show anything last summer that suggested he'd really be worth that weight. But I don't know. His, not, he has, his name hasn't really come up, to be honest. They need to find legit solutions at linebacker, not hope that a big name regains his old glory. It'd be, you know, I'm sure if, for Foster, it'd be great to see him, for, it'd be great for him to go back out there and show that stuff. It's just not what we saw last summer. And I don't know that that was something that they were really thinking of when they put him on IR. Again, I, I had heard more about 
keeping him in a good place because they genuinely liked the kid. They felt like his enthusiasm was, was infectious and all that. So I think there's a genuine liking for him. Where that goes, don't know. But again, find legitimate solutions. Quit hoping that guys re regain their old glory. Um, anyway, that's it for me. After this break, I'll be back with Jordan Reed as we discuss players you need to keep your eye on for Washington with the 19th pick. He picked a defensive player for Washington in his first mock. Find out who and why. What's up? It's Mike Jones from the Football Jones Podcast. I know you're enjoying your time with the John Kime Report, but once you're done, I want to invite you to come over and check out my podcast. Each week, we take a deep dive into some of the most pressing topics around the NFL. High-profile guests from the coach, player, and front office ranks, as well as the top league insiders. Check out the Football Jones Podcast, another fine product brought to you by Empire Media. Welcome back. Now here's my conversation with Jordan Reed. Well, Jordan, before we get into the nuts and bolts of what I want to have you on with the draft breakdowns and all that, I do want to start with your little journey because you did play Division I football as a quarterback, correct? correct. Um, but to go from there to doing this, that's something different. So how have you gotten better evaluating talent over the years? Where do you feel you've gotten better with that? Yeah, so it's definitely been an interesting journey. And one, I didn't even think I would be in like the situation that I'm in right now. But I'll just start off at the beginning. I actually started my football journey at a small school called North Carolina Central University, which is a small FCS school right around Duke University. Everybody has heard of Duke before in Durham, North Carolina. It's about five minutes away from there. So I played quarterback there from 2010 to 2013. After that, I went right into coaching. I didn't have any pro aspirations or anything like that just because I wanted to walk. By the time I was 30, I was taking a lot of hits <laughs> back there. So I said, man, you know what? I'd rather just call the shots behind the headset as opposed to being out there um, involved with a lot of those big guys and running away from them. So went into coaching. I was a graduate assistant at, at NCCU for two years. Then I, was, I had the pleasure of being a full-time coach there as well. We had a couple of coaches leave, and I was able to slide right into their slots. So I did that for three years, so five years total coaching. My last two years is really where I got my love for scouting just because I was named the recruiting coordinator there. And so you're starting to put all these pieces together as far as these puzzle pieces. You're in the living rooms of these recruits with mom and dad, and you're starting to learn these background stories of all these guys. And I'm like, man, I really love seeing all this thing, all these things come together. Uh, we were, we we're fortunate enough to win three championships. So I was starting to understand what it took to put a championship team together and just the scouting side of it is what I enjoyed more. So that's really where my love for scouting began. Um, I had twin girls in 2018, so I wanted a little <laughs> bit more job security. Yeah. And you know, with college coaching, I mean, you could be gone out of it in the pinch before you even know it. So I wanted a little bit more job security and I always had a love for journalism, uh, as you know, uh, blogs and things of that nature. Yeah. I, I kept all of those while I, even when I was playing, I used to always just write blogs. I didn't publish them or anything. Didn't have the confidence at the time to put my stuff out there. And so I just kept blogs whenever there was like a big transaction with sports or something, a landmark event happened. I would just jot down my thoughts about it quickly. But then I wanted to figure out a way to combine journalism and then also my scouting background in football as well. So an opportunity came up with the Draft Network. It was a startup company. I was freelancing at the time, just getting my stuff out there about um, some of the, the guys from the 2017 class. That was really my first year doing it for the most part, from a freelance perspective. And then before you know it, they really liked my stuff, my freelance stuff, and they they hired me full time. So that's how I'm in the position that I'm in today. How much did, when you're, because obviously when you play quarterback, you've got to see the entire field. You've got to know what guys around you are doing, but you have to know how to read a defense too. How much does it help in your evaluation of various positions? It helps a lot just because not only do you see the game from their lens, but you see it from a coaching perspective and also you see it from scouting perspective as well so I'm really seeing the game from three different lenses and when I'm scouting like a Trevor Lawrence or a Trey Lance I can put myself in their shoes maybe not I didn't play on that level of football but as far as how they're seeing the field maybe why they threw the pass right. this certain way or they threw it this certain direction or maybe they should have threw it this way as opposed to this way so it definitely helps a lot just being in their shoes at one point in my life. So we'll get to the quarterbacks in a few minutes because that's what obviously this franchise needs to find a quarterback. I do, before I go into them, I do want to start with a quarterback that 
from a couple of years ago who was in the draft, Sam Darnold. I'm curious your thoughts on him. And to be honest, like he's a very when I talk to people, it's very mixed what they think of him. What are your what are your thoughts on him? Is he worth taking a shot on? And at what cost? Yeah, I think he is worth taking a shot on just because we have seen the tools and the flashes of Sam Darnold. I think he's been kind of put in a bad situation as far as the environment with Adam Gase. It just wasn't a progressive type of environment of where he's known to groom quarterbacks. I think that's something with young quarterbacks. What we see is that if they're in a bad environment early on, it kind of scars or stains them for the rest of their career. And I think that's what Sam Darnold has really gotten accustomed to. And we've seen how quarterbacks have went away from Adam Gates or just players in general of where they've been able to kind of spread their wings and grow when they've been in a progressive or positive type of environment. Now, the big caveat or the big drawback for Sam Darnold is that you're going to have to allow him to play under the fifth-year option. And we know right. that's going to be a huge amount of money. So I think that's the one big caveat with Sam Darnold. Now, is he worth the fifth year option, I personally don't think he is. But if you're just looking for somebody that maybe can prove themselves for one year in a different type of environment, I think he would be worthy of that shot. It's just a matter of are you willing to pay him that 25, 30 million plus on that fifth year option? That's something that I would have a little bit of drawback of doing. From from a trade standpoint, what's one thing where you say, like, this is why I'd still give him a chance? And then what's the one thing that maybe gives you pause? aside from Gase, because he still has, you know, there's still going to be some concerns with him. So what's one thing that you say you can build on this? And the one thing you say, this is what concerns me. Well, I think he has everything that you want in a young quarterback as far as what it takes to, to succeed at the next level. Just because I think one requisite trait that every young quarterback has to have in the league nowadays is mobility. And I definitely think he has that. He's able to create on script, and then he can play off script as well. We've seen that during his time at the Jets. He has plenty of miraculous throws, but it's just a matter of processing with him. And he just doesn't seem like a very confident quarterback when he is out there. I don't know if that's just a lack of weapons or, or just a lack of trust in the environment. And that's why I said, like, maybe this could be a Ryan Tannehill situation of where he gets away from Gase. He hears another voice in his ear and his headset on game day, and maybe that's something that could help him in the long run. So I would take a shot on Sam Darnold. I think it's probably going to take a day two selection to get him, maybe a second or a third round pick. Uh, I think that would be fair value for him. I think a second will be a little bit rich for my blood, but maybe yeah, a third. Me too. I think a third, uh, I would be fine with that, especially when you're taking a shot on a quarterback, a young quarterback like that. I think Sam's only going to be 24 years old next year. So he's still very young at the position. I think you can kind of save him. Um, it's just a matter of the financial circumstances. That's the one thing that really does give me some drawback with Sam Darnold. Sure, and I'm with you. I wouldn't give up. I, The more I'm looking at it, the more I look at him, I'm not giving up a two, given the whole package that you have to get. Let's go to offensive linemen because you just, on your read option podcast, I love that title for the <laughs> podcast. It's fantastic. It's a lot more creative than the John Kime report, <laughs> for example. Um, so, you know, I should have gone with like prime Kime or Kime, you know, Kime time, whatever, something like it. But yeah. read option podcast. Um, great name. So you just did something with Brandon Thorne about mm -hmm. offensive tackles. This team needs, wants to get better on the line. So, tackles a strong possibility before I get into who you like there and who might be there Sadiq Charles last year drafted as a guard or a tackle they're still kind of mixed on him where they think he can go do you think he could play tackle in this league at an effective level I like him better at guard honestly John just because he does lack some length out there on the perimeter he's a bit of an undersized guy about six foot four I think he came in at like 295 right at the combine so uh, I, I do worry about his lack of length there on the perimeter. And I actually like Sadiq coming out, but there were some red flags coming out about him, uh, which I'm sure you, you're very well aware of once they selected him. But uh, the injury situation was really unfortunate with him just because I think they were going to try him at left tackle. And I think that would have been good for him to trial and error period, especially they've kind of been searching for that next guy after Trent Williams. It's kind of been like a game of musical chairs at that left tackle spot. So, I think Sadiq will be better inside just because I think he needs some guys around him. I think uh, he, he lacks length, so he's going to struggle out on the perimeter by himself. But um, at guard, I think he definitely can be starter level. It's just a matter of him staying on field on the field and then just seeing what actually he can do. So we'll play off that then. So now we'll go to the tackles. They pick 19. Who do you like in that range? Christian Derisau is a name that you hear yeah. in that range. Who do you like in there as a left tackle? Um, in that in that ballpark 
Yeah, the great thing about the Washington football team is that I think they're going to have a, a wealth of options as far as what they want to do, that they want to trade up for a quarterback. But if they don't end up trading up for a quarterback, maybe they could sit there and take uh, Christian Derisau. Um, I don't think Derisau will be there just because there's so many offensive tackle needy teams yeah. ahead of him. The Chargers are an obvious one. Um, there's plenty of others ahead of him. I think the Vikings possibly could go tackle as well. And even somebody like the Patriots, they could go offensive tackle if they don't decide to take a quarterback. So uh, somebody like a Jalen Mayfield from Michigan, I right. think somebody could be in contention uh, at that spot. Elijah Vera Tucker from USC, who I'm a big fan of. That's a, I, I know that's could, one of your guys. Yeah, yeah, that's one of my guys. I definitely think he's a player that could be a plug-and-play option at that offensive tackle spot. Or I think 19 is a little bit early for Leatherwood, so if they want to trade back maybe into like the, the 30s or early second round to pick up some extra picks to get Leatherwood, I definitely think he could be an option. But one guy I really like, for, for the Washington football team is Tevin Jenkins from Oklahoma State. Yeah. You're starting to see his draft stock really rise here lately. He was supposed to play in the Senior Bowl. I'm not really sure what happened with that. Uh, he ended up pulling out late. But I think if he would have played in the Senior Bowl, I definitely think he probably would have been. He wouldn't have been up there with Sewell and Slater. But as far as that second tier group, I definitely think he probably would have been one of the headliners in that group. So keep an eye on Tevin Jenkins at 19. He would be a really good fit. And, you know, if you bring it up too, like there is some, it seems like, and I think just, I think you even said that this is a really good class for offensive mm -hmm. tackles. So, and it's also a good class for receivers, another position they need. Conceivably, they can trade back and pick up, you know, get, you know, trade back in the first round and still get a guy that they like at either one of those positions, right? Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I've kind of struggled with taking wide receivers in the first round here lately, just because, Day two has been a gold mine for right. those guys. And even going back to last year, like Denzel Mims, LaVisca Chenault, and some of these other guys. And, I mean, even on the Washington football team, Terry McLaurin, they found him later on in the draft. So I've kind of had some drawback with taking receivers early on just because you can find those guys the second or third round and they can contribute, come in and contribute and give you the same type of production that these early round guys are doing. And they're going to have their, their – they're going to have plenty of choices on day two, and I like a lot of the guys in this draft, like Amara St. Brown, the wide receiver from USC, right. I think could be a fit. Um, Kadarius Tony will probably go on day one now. I think his stock is really starting to soar through the roof, um, but he would be a really good fit. And then De'Ami Brown from North Carolina, I think he could be a really good fit for them as well. You're, now, you're all, are you high on Amari Rogers too? I am. And so, because there, it seems like there's a lot of the five nine, five ten, yeah. fast slot guys in this draft. Is that where the strength of this draft at receiver is? And would that be, you know, are those guys that you would look at for here? Yeah, absolutely. And I think size can kind of be a fallacy with wide. Well, they want speed first and foremost. I'll say yeah, that for sure. And you know, Amari Rogers isn't a super burner type of guy. Um, but if you want somebody that can just – he just has a natural ability to get open. That's something that you notice about him. He was probably the top option on that Clipson offense this year with Trevor Lawrence. But Elijah Moore from Ole Miss is another one that I think right. would be a fantastic fit if they're looking for a speed guy that definitely can get some yards after the catch as well. So, I mean, like I said, they're going to have plenty of options on day two. It's just a matter of picking the right guy, which is always the case in the draft. And they've done a good job with drafting, uh, especially in the mid to later rounds here in the past few years. But I think they're going to have plenty of options if they want to wait on receiver or in, in, during day two or day three. Would you would you trade up for one of these quarterbacks? And if so, how high would you? Obviously, you have to get to a certain point. But how yeah. like how many picks would be would you be willing to move up and to give up to move up for one of these guys? Well, two to three is obviously the logical amount of picks that you're going to have to give up. You're probably going to have to give up your first rounder next year in a combination of some type of day two picks after that, but. I've kind of been banging this drum a lot with the Washington football team just because I don't think, obviously, Lawrence or Fields is probably – Lawrence, Fields, and Wilson are probably out of the picture right. for the Washington football team. So it really comes down to two guys. It's Trey Lance and Mac Jones if they want to take a, a guy in the first round. And a guy that I think is absolutely perfect, and outside of Atlanta, I think Washington football team is the best fit for him, is Trey Lance from North Dakota State just because he has to go to a situation – of where he has to sit behind somebody for a year or a year and a half. You kind of need to put him on that Patrick Mahomes type of plan of maybe he starts during the latter half of the backstretch of his first year, but he's not going to be ready walking through the door. So you already have Alex Smith there. We'll see what does happen uh, with his future, just because the comments he came out right, with right. was a little bit odd the other day, but you still have Taylor Heineke. I love that they have that insurance. And they'll have Kyle Allen. Kyle Allen Kyle as well. So he's not going to be forced to play right away if they take Trey Lance. 
Uh, I just really like his fit there with the Washington football team just because he's not going to be forced to play right away. But as far as the tools and the upside that he's walking through the door with right now, I'm a big fan of him. And, you know, it's funny because early in the process, and I talked to somebody in the fall who was not that high on him, but I also knew that there were other people who were, right? And then what you hear about him, too, is that he is, I know he's playing at a, he was playing at a lo- lesser level, but it's also what he was being asked to do at the line of scrimmage. Could you yeah. see him doing different, like being asked in the response? Can you tell when you're watching that he has a different level of responsibility than those other quarterbacks in this draft? And by that, it's like, you know, whether it's the, what they're telling, asking to do at the line or whatever. Can you, can you see that? Yeah, and I hate using the term pro ready just because there's so many different variances of that. But as far as setting his own protections, running a huddle based offense, which just means he has more responsibilities and things that are put on his plate. Um, they didn't ask him to do a whole bunch as far as a progression standpoint, but from a protections and then pre-snap awareness type of stuff, I think he had the most responsibilities of anybody in this class. And you, you've heard plenty of reviews about him as far as he's probably going to knock it out of the park on the whiteboard just because of the things that he was, as far as the things that were put on his plate. So uh, I think him already having that type of stuff down pat, I think that's really going to help him in the future. So he's already going to be, He's going to have a very high level of football IQ walking through the door, which is huge for a rookie quarterback. And so how how high do you think you have to go up to get him? Because it is a premium position. He does have a lot of ability, but he's going to have to sit. So we're, you know, and I'm again, I think a lot of these quarterbacks, everybody's going to be split on. So I think, but, you know, but how high do you think you'd have to go up to get somebody like him? So I think that seven to 10 range, I think that's kind of the sweet spot just because eight with the Carolina Panthers, I think the worst kept secret this year is that they're going to try to get a quarterback <laughs> yes. Yes. somehow. So you're looking at that seventh spot with Detroit. I don't think Detroit is going to take a quarterback just because they have Jared Goff and Brad Holmes. I think he's going to give Goff an opportunity to prove that he can be the guy just because he was responsible for drafting him with less need. So I don't think the Lions are going to take a quarterback. So it's probably going to have to be seven. They're, they're going to have to jump the Panthers somehow if the Panthers don't go from eight to three with Miami to get um, probably Fields or Lawrence, whoever the Jets don't select. So I think seven to 10 is probably that sweet spot. But I think it starts at seven if you want to go up and get Trey Lance, which may be a bit rich. But we know with quarterbacks, you have to go up and get them if you like them. Well, if you like them, you, you're you going to be aggressive. And I know like one thing they want to make sure is they can still build around a guy. Yeah. Um, so as long as you're able to get some pieces, like, and it depends on what you do in free agency too, to lead you into that. Like if you're getting some free agent receivers and you fill mm-hmm. this hole here and you can still do this in the draft with like the second pick, whatever, then it gives you some flexibility and they do have two third round picks. Hey, this is Joel Corey from inside the cap. I know you're enjoying the John Conn report, which gives you insider access to the Washington football team. Everything you want you want to know, which is going on with the Washington football team. Once you're done with that, check out my podcast, Inside the Cap, which gives you the ins and outs of the NFL salary cap and player contract negotiations. Check out these two products and other fine podcasts from Empire Media. The one quarterback I want to ask about because I have my alma mater is Ohio State, and Justin Fields has been getting picked apart as much as anybody. What is your and and you know sometimes you hear like oh maybe he falls out of a certain range and maybe you can go get him because it just depends on how these teams rank these quarterbacks. But what what's your assessment of him and is a lot of this is some of this stuff unfair or do you think to feel like it's accurate some of the holes being poked in him? Yeah, it's kind of unfair, but it's kind of predictable as well. I will say that just because, and I wrote about this, I think it was a couple months ago, and that the Ohio State thing with quarterbacks is something that is eventually going to come up about Fields. And I think the difference between Fields is that with prior Ohio State quarterbacks, they had players back there that they really tried to learn the position as far as athletes and mold them into quarterbacks, as opposed to Fields, who was already an athlete that was already polished at the position. And you're talking about guys like Braxton Miller and Terrell Pryor and Cardo Jones and JT Bear, all these guys that were pretty much athletes their entire lives outside of Jones. And they really tried to mold them into quarterbacks. And I think Justin Fields is the exact opposite of that. Now, does he have some things that he needs to clean up? Sure. As far as the one read stuff um, that you're hearing come out about about him, I think that's the furthest thing from the truth. I think it's just a matter of him 
just trying to be too perfect at the position and trying right. to stick to the script a little bit too much. And I put up a video about this. You did. Ago. It was very good. Yeah, thank you. And I put up a video about this and just talking about how he tries to stick to the script a little bit too much and he needs to go off the grid a little bit too much. And then what happened a little bit more, I should say, and what happens with that is it results in him holding the ball a little bit too long and he just needs to process and speed up his mental process and clock a little bit more. And there were some similar concerns about Josh Allen coming out and you saw how he was placed in a good environment with weapons and then the adequate type of coaching to where you can coach him up as far as speeding up his mental clock as well. So I just like the raw tools that Justin Fields comes through walking through the door with and being able to mold some of those things and kind of alter some of the things that he needs to change a little bit. So I'm a big fan of Fields. I like him a lot. He's the second best quarterback in this draft to me. Well, he he's he's the best, and I, I've followed that school for a long, long time. He's the best quarterback they've had. So yeah. the comparison to other guys before him, I don't feel as apt. I know, like, because Dwayne was just there, but he's more mature and more of a leader than Dwayne was yeah. when he was there. And, you know, that's – and he's he's more athletic than Dwayne was now. There's – you got to learn how to call plays in the huddle. you got to learn this. Mm-hmm. But most quarterbacks coming in the league now have to learn the same stuff. Because they're, you know, Joe Burrow had to go learn the same stuff, and he did. So I, I like Justin Fields a lot. He's very active down the field, and I also think sometimes their offense ran a lot of slow developing downfield plays because they had the playmakers to get down there. So we'll see. He's got holes. They all do. Um, Mac Jones. He's another guy that you brought up, Trey Lance or Mac Jones. What do you think of him? And would he be a guy? Like I know Jim Nagy was very high on him. What are your thoughts on him? I like Mac, and I was responsible for scouting Alabama this year. So I got to see him last year where he started the last four games of the year when Tua went down with a hip injury. Uh, So I got to see Mac from really before a lot of people got to know him as Mac Jones, the starter. And I thought he had a lot of intriguing tools. But then this year, he really takes the next step in his development when he's the guy in that offense. So the one thing that does worry me about Mac Jones is just the mobility standpoint. And I think his type of quarterback is really a dying breed in the league. And you're seeing guys like Phillip Rivers retire, Eli Manning recently retired. Um, and there's plenty of other examples. Tom Brady is really like the last of this breed that really can just win from the pocket and dissect defenses with their mind. While not, well, I wouldn't say lacking mobility, while not being an upper echelon type of athlete like we have seen right. with these young quarterbacks and that have come into the league and had immediate success like Kyler Murray and Justin Herbert and Joe Burrow, all these guys can move inside and outside of the pocket and really make offensive coordinators right whenever they choose the wrong play just because they can use their legs and extend plays and make those miraculous throws down the field. Mac Jones is just not capable of doing that. And that's not to say that he's not going to have success in the league, but I just think he's going to be a huge outlier of all the quarterbacks that have come out in the last five years. And if you think about it, the ones that have not had success, Dwayne Haskins and Josh Rosen, they have lacked mobility. So right. that's the one thing that really worries me about Mac Jones. But as far as an awareness, IQ, accuracy, he has all of those things, but he's missing the big thing in mobility. You know, it's funny, too, because I know a couple of years ago before that draft with Haskins, this team was high on Kyler Murray because they knew that, listen, as he develops as a quarterback, he can make plays because of his legs. So it allows you to get them in there and to run an offense with them while they are learning the position. And it allows them to contribute a lot sooner than than other positions you'd be able to. Absolutely. And it's going to be interesting. But like I said, I think Trey Lance will be the best fit for them overall. But it wouldn't surprise me if Mac Jones is the only quarterback left for them if they decide to stick at 19. And that's assuming the Patriots pass on him at 15. But Mac Jones definitely is a dying breed type of quarterback, so he'll be a huge outlier if he goes on to have success. Is there a quarterback in the middle rounds that you say, I'm intrigued by this guy, like to where maybe like this is the guy that I'm going to watch where he goes because he could develop into something? Is there anybody yeah. in that? There's one, uh, or there's actually a couple. Davis Mills from Stanford. You're starting to right. see his name come up a yeah. little bit more. He's, ha- he's had some injury questions and some injury issues throughout his career, but he doesn't have a super strong arm, but he has those requisite requisite tools that you look for entering the league. And another one is Jamie Newman. Uh, I say from Wake yep. Forest just because he never played a game at Georgia. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> he has the arm strength that you're looking for, but he just throws fastballs on everything. He doesn't understand how to throw a changeup or a sinker or a curveball from time <laughs> to time. Everything is just a fastball with him. And then he's just so raw. He played in an unconventional offense at Wake Forest, but he put up some really good numbers. 
and he just makes some really nice throws uh, at all three levels of the field, but he's just so raw coming into the game. He's going to need at least two to three years to sit. So maybe he may end up like a, I'm not saying he's going to end up like Dak, but just, just kind of paint a picture of the, the progression or plan that he needs to be put on. Uh, it's kind of similar like a Dak Prescott plan of where he can just come in and sit back for a couple of years and maybe you can get something out of him as a long-term starter. Now I want to get to the other side of the ball because, uh, you know, I think corner and linebacker are intriguing spots for this team because they, they need some more corner depth and they have a free agent Ronald Darby may or may not get him resigned, which means you'd need a corner, but let's start with your, I think it was your last mock draft or your first one, or maybe that's the same one where you had a linebacker come in here. Mm-hmm. Fill me in here. And I I know, like, I think people would like this pick. It's the kid from Notre Dame. So fill me in. It was Jeremiah Owusu. I think it's, is it Ko- Koromoa? Yeah, Koromoa. Um, really intriguing player. And I think he was the best player on Notre Dame's defense a year ago as far as draft eligible players. He's kind of that crossover of safety linebacker hybrid. You don't really want him playing in the box a ton. You really want to keep him out on the perimeter of where he can kind of play free just because he does struggle detaching from blockers when he is in the box. But as far as his explosiveness, his his ability to uncoil his hip, wrap up guys and bring them down to the ground, uh, I think he probably would have ran in the low four fours. It wouldn't even surprise me if he would have, excuse me, the high four fours and low four fives, that wouldn't surprise me. Um, but I just really like this player from an explosiveness standpoint and then the versatility that he can that he can bring to a defense. And I think they did a really good job of drafting last year, finding a guy like a Cameron Curl, who I think is going to yeah. be a, a long term option for them at safety, uh, pairing him uh, with a guy like a Wusu Karamoa that can play that strong safety rover linebacker type of position of where he, he can cover tight ends. He can cover those slot receivers. I think he has the athleticism to do that and just continue to add that versatility on one, what I think is already one of the best defenses in the league. I think he could be another piece to help them. That, that versatility when with it, with the game going to so many RPOs and all that, how important is it to have a linebacker like that? And just, you know what I mean? When you're put there, you're trying to put you in a position where you've got to make a decision. They're going to play off your read and you got to be able to bounce out. What, how important is that? It's very important just because the one way to where you can scheme up to start to stop RPOs is to play man coverage, but you have to have the bodies to do so. You have to have the personnel right. to match up with these teams that go three to four wide receiver sets. And I think Owusu Koromoa is definitely capable of doing that. And, you know, the Clemson game in the ACC championship was kind of like a complete a tale of two tales with him just because they really started to go RPO stuff against him. But they were playing primarily zone coverage. But during the first matchup, they allowed him to play man coverage. And I think that was one of his better games of the year. But you see the athleticism. You see the flashes of greatness with him. And I think he's a really intriguing player. Um, Cornerback. Again, if they go to if they went that direction. And again, I don't know that. I think linebacker would be if that guy's there, that guy's a really good player. Um, mm-hmm. is there, are there, how's this corner class and where is the value? Do you have to get one high or can you get one after the first round? that you like as a starter? Well, so the three consensus top guys right now are um, Caleb Farley from Virginia Tech, Patrick Sertain the second from Alabama, and then J.C. Horn from South Carolina. Those are probably right. the top three guys right now. And I think all those guys. But you got another gone. favorite outside of those guys. Yeah, I have quite a few. Um, Tyson Campbell from Georgia is one that I like a lot. And he's kind of, he's still trying to figure out the sum of being all of his parts, but he reminds me a lot of Carlton Davis uh, coming out of mm-hmm. Auburn just to paint a picture of him. And I think you probably can get him late first, early second, if they want to trade back. But I think 19 is a little bit too rich for him. Um, but if they're looking for somebody that can be a long-term answer at that cornerback spot, I think Darby's a free agent, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So they're probably yes. going to need to fill uh, one of those cornerback spots. So Tyson Campbell definitely is one, but my biggest uh, drive crush, I would say right now is Greg Newsom the second from Northwestern. You're starting to see his name. I actually have a story coming out about him here in a couple of minutes or so uh, cool. where I actually got to sit down and talk with him. So he, he's one of my biggest draft crushes right now, but he does have some durability concerns with him. Uh, he hasn't been able to play a full season yet, but he said all those injuries came in practice. It wasn't a situation of where he's had any surgeries. Uh, his injuries didn't come in games or anything like that, but he played in the first half against Ohio State in the Big Ten championship game, and he pitched a shutout. They didn't try really him good. at all. He, he was really good in that game. He gave up the least amount of receiving yards of any cornerback in the country this year as well. So I think that's a really telling stat of how much respect he had uh, amongst everybody around the country. And I think he's a player that could be a surprise first-round selection. 
Um, two more things. One, do you going back to Cam Curl? Do you? They have Landon Collins coming back. Somebody's got to play big nickel. You need somebody a strong safety. Do you feel, based on what you saw of Cam Curl this year and even in college, do you feel he could play free safety? Yeah, I think so. And he was a huge surprise to me. Um, I didn't think he was going to flash as much as he did. And, I mean, the league agrees. I believe he was a sixth-round pick, so uh, he was a later-round guy. But I really like what he showed this year. I think he has the flexibility in order to play free safety. Now, do you want him to play there down in and down out? No. But as far as that versatility of where he can play sometimes on the roof and then he could rotate with Landon Collins coming down to play down and sub packages as well, I think he's able to do that as well. Um, last thing, with because of the weirdness of this year and the lack of all these all-star games that we normally have, the lack of a combine, what's it going to be like the second half of this draft, like rounds four through seven? How crazy could that get? How do you think that team's going to be more varied than ever as far as who they like compared to someone else? And, and I mean, I would assume there's a lot of value for teams because you might be able to pluck gems that you never thought that you may not have gotten in the past, you know, that just slipped through for whatever reason. Yeah, and, you know, just talking to some scouting buddies that work for some teams around the industry, it's kind of been mixed reviews. You get some reviews of where, like, they're saying, man, we just want to make sure we get on base with some draft picks. But there's some teams that are like, we're still going to go for home runs based on hmm. the information that we do have. So it's going to kind of be very unpredictable. But I think the biggest difference between this draft, draft process and last year is that COVID hit, I believe, in, like, the latter half of February, early March. And they were just looking for numbers at the combine. So a lot of draft portfolios and resumes were pretty much 90% done last year for the most part when COVID hit. But now it's like a blank slate with a lot of these guys. And you're trying to get verified numbers from schools, verify height, weight measurements. So there's a lot of teams really trying to uh, get to the finish line right now with a lot of guys. And then you're having pro days come up right now. So there's going to be a huge delay in the process now. And with FCS guys, there's going to be some people that are playing uh, le leading up to the draft, which right. is absolutely just unprecedented territory for, for a lot of people in the scouting industry. So I don't really have a definite answer as far as uh, is it going to be crazy or if some teams are going to be safe for the most part. I think it's going to be a mixed bag of both. All right. Jordan, that's fantastic insight on all this stuff. Tell people where they can follow you, read you, and you have newsletters coming out and, and all that. Yeah, so you can find me on Twitter at Jordan underscore Reed. That's J-O-R-D-A-N underscore R-E-I-D. No, I am not the former Washington football tight end. I, I didn't even want to get into that because I'm sure you get tired of that. <laughs> yeah, I get plenty of that. Um, that's why I changed my Twitter name just to make sure to spill it out. Uh, so you can find me, Jordan <laughs> underscore Reed. You can also find my work at thedraftnetwork.com. We have a lot of great things going on over there. You can do our mock draft simulator as well. So if you want to go through all of the football team's picks, you definitely can do that. We have scouting reports on over 500 prospects in the country as well. So you can read. It's uh, really reports good. from from Trevor Lawrence all the way down to Division two and Division three prospects as well. And the Read Option podcast. Don't forget that. Absolutely. There you go. Jordan, thank you very much for your time. Very generous. I appreciate it. Thanks so much, John. It's a pleasure. That's it for this podcast. Thanks to Jordan Reed for joining me and thank you for listening. I'll be back with another podcast on Thursday. Also, just remember, as we start to get into the news portion of the offseason, as news happens, there will be an occasional emergency podcast. I'll talk to you next time.